Hello everyone and welcome to my channel, Histories of Airliners. Today we're taking a trip down memory lane to explore one of the most iconic airplanes ever built, the Boeing 707. This four-engine jetliner revolutionized air travel in the 1950s and 60s and it's still a beloved aircraft among aviation enthusiasts today. But what happens to these planes when they retire? Well, some lucky ones get to live out their days in museums and outdoor displays where they can be enjoyed by future generations. So today, we're going on a virtual scavenger hunt to find all the preserved Boeing 707s around the world. As you can see, there are museum-housed and outdoor-displayed Boeing 707s scattered all over the globe, from North America to Europe to Asia. But don't worry, we're not going to visit all of them in one video. Instead, we're going to focus on some of the most interesting and accessible ones. Our journey to find museum-displayed Boeing 707s begins in North America. Where else to begin but with the first flying 707, initially known as the Boeing Model 367-80, or Dash 80 for short. While containing many structural and electrical differences from production 707s, the contribution of this particular aircraft to the overall design is indisputable. Built in 1954, this aircraft was used to prove jet airliner concepts to airliner owners all over the world. Even when the 707 was solidly in production, this aircraft was used to test military and civilian aircraft design concepts until 1973. The aircraft had been at this point donated to the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and all that was needed was space to display it, which wouldn't arrive until 2003 when the Udvar Hazy Annex was built near the Dulles International Airport. This is where this aircraft sits on display to this day in early 2024. The next 707 that is on display in North America started life with Ward Air Canada in 1969. The aircraft would have several operators from that day to 1985. These included not only Ward Air Canada, but also Montana, Austria, Sudan Airways, and Nigeria Airways, which flew this aircraft with its Montana, Austria livery and registration. In 1985, the aircraft was taken in by the United States Air Force as a VIP transport VC-137. Seven years later, the U.S. Air Force would convert this aircraft to an E-8 J-Star battle management aircraft. In 2023, the aircraft was retired to the Museum of Aviation at the Warner Robins Air Force Base in the U.S. state of Georgia. Our last stop in North America is a cockpit section of a former LL-707. This aircraft served LL from its delivery in 1961 to the date it was placed in storage at the Ben Garion International Airport in 1984. After this, the aircraft was partially scrapped with only the cockpit section being saved. From 1985 to 2000, this section of the original aircraft was on display inside the hull of the USS Intrepid Museum in New York City. From 2000 to present, it has been on display in the Cradle of Aviation Museum in Garden City, New York on Long Island. Four examples of the Boeing 707 survive on display in Europe for the Euroset aviation fans. Our first stop in Europe is at the French Air and Space Museum, located in the southeastern edge of the Paris Le Berger Airport, north of Paris. This aircraft, registered as Foxtrot Bravo Lima Charlie Delta, was delivered to Air France in 1966. Air France passenger service continued until September of 1982. The aircraft has been on display outside the French Air and Space Museum since April of 1983. The next stop is at the Brussels Royal Museum of the Armed Forces and Military History in Belgium. This Boeing 707 was delivered in December of 1959 to the Belgian airliner of Sibina. Over the 1970s, the aircraft would be leased to a series of African airlines for short-term operations such as Air Algerie, Mandela Airlines, and Cameroon Airlines. The aircraft ended its career with Sobel Air, a charter airliner belonging to Sabina. This aircraft was eventually withdrawn from passenger service in 1981, with the nose section of the aircraft being put on display in early 1982. Across the English Channel, another nose section of a Boeing 707 can be found at the Museum of Flight in East Fortune, Scotland. This aircraft was initially delivered to the British Overseas Airways Corporation, usually called BOAC for short, in September of 1960. After a decade of service with BOAC, the aircraft spent a few years leased to both Malaysian Singapore Airlines and the follow-on company called Malaysian Airlines System, an earlier name to the current Malaysian Airlines. 
By the mid-1970s, the aircraft returned to Britain with service with Boeing's successor, British Airways. In 1977, the aircraft was transferred over to the holiday charter airliner, British Air Tours, a subsidiary of British Airways. The aircraft was withdrawn from service in the early 1980s. Initially, the whole aircraft was preserved at the Royal Air Force Museum, Cosford. After 2006, the aircraft itself was scrapped while the nose section was preserved in Boat colors at the aforementioned Museum of Flight in East Fortune, Scotland. We find ourselves back in Belgium, this time with the city of Vetern, just outside of Kent. Like many 707s back during this period of time, the aircraft started with Pan American Airways, named Klepper Resolute. This started in 1961 and ended in 1970 when the aircraft was leased and then eventually purchased by Lloyd International Airways in 1971. However, by 1972, Bahamas World Airlines purchased the aircraft. Poor financial times caused this aircraft to be repossessed by Bahamas World's Bank in 1974. In 1978, the aircraft was leased by Southeast Airlines for about a year's worth of passenger service. The aircraft would swap hands a few times between aircraft leasing companies until purchased by the Age of Enlightenment Aviation Company in 1984. After this, the government of Benin purchased the airplane as a VIP transport. Then the aircraft was put into storage in 1989 and eventually purchased for display in 1997. Initially, the aircraft was displayed on top of a local building in Ventern, but after complaints from the local government, the aircraft was lowered onto the parking lot of the building it used to be on top of. The next step of our journey for Museum Boeing 707s takes us to the continent of Asia. Our first example of the Boeing 707 on this continent can be found at the Hatzer Museum outside of Tel Aviv, Israel. Usually this aircraft served the North American market with service to Transworld Airlines, otherwise known as TWA. Delivered in 1959, this aircraft would transfer over to the Israeli Air Force in 1972, after conversion to a cargo freighter in 1971. By 1983, its time flying was done and the aircraft would be modified again to be a cinema for the museum it is now located at. A few hundred miles to the east is where we find our second Boeing 707 on museum display in Asia. This aircraft started life as Clipper Peerless with Pan American Airways in 1966. Nine years later, the march of technology saw this aircraft sold to an aircraft sales and leasing company which then proceeded to export this airliner to Iran in 1975 for passenger service with Iran Air. When this aircraft reached 2002, the aircraft was repurposed to serve as a restaurant at the Tehran Marabad Museum, initially wearing the standard Iran Air livery until 2010, when it gained its own unique livery for its unique purpose. From here, we head almost due south to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where, at the Royal Saudi Air Force Museum in Riyadh, we find an aircraft produced and sold in 1975 to the Saudi flight carrier airline Saudia. From 1975 to 1979, this aircraft flew paying passenger service in and out of the Middle East. In 1979, the aircraft was acquired by the Kingdom's Royal Family for their personal transport aircraft, allowing this plane to be seen worldwide when members of the Royal Family made official state visits to various nations around the world. The aircraft retired from its VIP service in 2003, placed on display at the Royal Saudi Air Force Museum where it sits today in early 2024. We journey due south from Saudi Arabia to find our one and only museum called a Boeing 707 on display in Africa. The lone Boeing 707 on display can be found at the South African Air Force Museum in Swartz, Calvin, Victoria. This airliner started with Air France, named as Chateau de la Roche Bourbon, flying with Air France from 1968 to 1981. So this aircraft would find itself on the African continent the South African Air Force from 1983 to the year 1996. At this point, the long-serving aircraft was retired and placed at this museum for all citizens of South Africa to see. We travel across the South Atlantic Ocean to visit three more examples of the Boeing 707 in South America. Our first stop into South America lands us at the Museo Nacional de Aeronáutica y del Espacio, found in Chile's capital city of Santiago. This aircraft started life in 1960s West Germany, flying for the West German flag carrier Lufthansa. During its time with Lufthansa, it was named Duisburg in Berlin. From 1967 to 1969, this aircraft was leased to the Condor Airline, which was and still is the charter holiday airline. 
Returned to Lufthansa in early 1969, this airliner would continue to fly across Europe until 1974, when it was acquired by Land Chile. Another 12 years of paying passenger service finally saw this aircraft retired to the aforementioned Air and Space Museum in Santiago, where it sits today on display in the Land Chile livery it wore during its service days. The next stop on the Boeing 707 tour is several hundred miles to the northwest in the nation of Paraguay, just outside the city of Asuncion. Like we've seen before, this Boeing 707 started with Pan American Airways, delivered in 1966 for worldwide service. While with Pan Am, the aircraft was named Clipper Monsoon. After 12 years of service with Pan Am, the airliner was transferred to the Paraguayan airline known as Líneas Aéreas Paraguayas, also known as LAPSA. In 1994, the aircraft was transferred to the Paraguayan Air Force and converted for use as a presidential transport, but was not actually used for this purpose. Sometime after 1994, the aircraft was transferred to the Museo de la Historia de Líneas Aéreas Paraguayas, Hotel de Rancho, where as you can see here, you can swim underneath a 707. The last stop on our whirlwind tour of Museum Boeing 707s lands us in the Australian Outback. To our knowledge, there is only one Boeing 707 on display in Australia. First delivered to Qantas in 1959, this shorter range version of the 707 was replaced by longer range 707s and eventually 747s by 1969. It was that year this aircraft was transferred to Canada to fly for the airline known as Pacific Western Airlines. In the 1980s, the aircraft was traded around by aircraft holding companies until 1987, wherein the aircraft was purchased by the Saudi Arabian government as a VIP transport for a former Saudi ambassador to the United States, Prince Bandar bin Sultan Al Saud. From 1999 to 2006, this aircraft was placed in storage at the South End Airport near London, England. This aircraft made its last flight returned to the Qantas livery it had worn when first delivered to the Long Reach Queensland Airport to be on permanent display alongside a Qantas 747-200 at the Qantas Founders Outback Museum. There are many other examples of surviving Boeing 707s that can be found around the world. However, most of these are either abandoned aircraft or in some cases still used by local airport authorities as ground training aircraft. The former Qantas Boeing 707 that used to be owned and operated by celebrity John Travolta has been slowly going through rebuilding and eventually be certified once again to fly to Australia to be placed on display in the future. Our journey to find museum display Boeing 707s begins again in North America. This journey begins in a small aviation museum in Miami, Florida known as the Wings Over Miami Air Museum. While hosting many airworthy aircraft, the aircraft in question has the smallest remnant of all the aircraft we are covering in this video. Beginning in 1966, a Boeing 707-321B was delivered to Pan American Airways and named Clipper Yankee Ranger. The aircraft was registered as November 418 Papa Alpha. The career of this aircraft lasted from 1966 to 1980. The aircraft was sold to the Israeli Aircraft Industries Corporation. This company took it apart and repurposed a majority of the aircraft. However, the cockpit section was acquired by Kermit Weeks for his Linda Museum in Miami. Initially, the aircraft cockpit section was displayed outdoors with the paint scheme of a 1970s era KC-135, with new nose art included. At this time, however, the only remnant remaining is that section that has the nose art on it. Three examples of the Boeing 707 survive on display in Europe for our European-based av geeks. The first stop in Europe is at the Museo do Arche in Sintra, Portugal. In this museum, you will find the cockpit section of a Boeing 707 that started life with TAP Air Portugal in October of 1968. While with TAP Air Portugal, the airplane was named after Portuguese explorer Lorenzo Marques. Sometime between 1968 and 1986, the aircraft was acquired by the Zaire Air Force and then converted in late 1986 to be a presidential VIP aircraft. From 1996 to 2006, the aircraft was stored at the Lisbon Airport due to the Zaire and then the follow-on Democratic Republic of the Congo governments unable to pay for the airport fees for the aircraft. A majority of the aircraft was broken up in Lisbon, Portugal, with the cockpit section going to the aforementioned Museo do Arce. 
I should note that the left side of the aircraft is painted in the TAP Air Portugal livery when it was delivered and on the right hand side is painted in Portuguese Air Force colors, a group this aircraft never flew for. Across the Irish Sea in County Leitrim, in the northern parts of the Republic of Ireland, there is one 707 remnant on outdoor display. This aircraft started its passenger paying career, as many other Boeing 707s had, with Pan Am. This aircraft was delivered in 1961 and stayed with Pan Am until 1970. From there, it would be leased to Lloyd International, but was repossessed by the bank in 1972. And then from there, it would go on to Bahamas World that same year, but again, it would be repossessed by the bank in 1984. The aircraft was broken up in Dublin Island that same year and has been on outdoor display at the Caven and Leitrim Railway Museum ever since, along with other airplane pieces and parts. Back on continental Europe, we travel all the way to Sinsheim, Germany, to their Technik Museum to find another 707 cockpit section on display. This aircraft started out life in 1959 with American Airlines in that company's Astrojet livery, named after the state of Arkansas. By 1974, the aircraft was transferred to the Quebec-based Quebec Air. After it stayed in Canada, the aircraft flew across the Atlantic Ocean to fly for United African Airlines in and out of Libya. By 1983, the aircraft was back in the United States, then flown to Brussels, and then broken up for scrap. The last part of this aircraft remains in the Technik Museum in Sinsheim, Germany. Still in Germany, we head southeast to Munich. This Boeing 707 started its paying passenger career with American Airlines in 1959 wearing the Astrojet livery. This aircraft stayed with American Airlines through many years and many flights and a second red, white, and blue livery. Then in 1980, the aircraft was acquired by American Transair for several years of charter flights in and around North America. Boeing bought back this aircraft in 1984 and it was broken up in 1986. Since 1988, the aircraft has been on display at the Oberschleitheim Museum Munich, wearing Lutanza colors from the 1960s. We journey almost due south to find one remnant Boeing 707 on display in Africa. This lone Boeing 707 remnant can be found at the Rand Airport just south of Johannesburg, South Africa. This airliner started life out with South African Airlines in 1969. At this time, it was named East London, or in Afrikaans, East London. By 1978, this aircraft had migrated up to Luxembourg to fly with Luxair. A year later, in 1979, the aircraft moved again to Jordan to fly for Alia Royal Jordanian Airlines, then to Africa again to fly for Safair in 1985. The aircraft changed hands again in 1989 to fly for Liberia World Airlines. By 1995, the aircraft was back in its original country of South Africa, where it was taken up by the South African Air Force as a transport. After this, the aircraft was mostly broken up, but the cockpit section was put on display around 2011 at the aforementioned Rand Airport, where it sits today in 2024. We now travel across the Indian Ocean to visit one more example of the Boeing 707 in Australia. A confirmed example of a Boeing 707 on display is at the Historical Aircraft Restoration Society facility in Richmond, Queensland, Australia. This aircraft has been down under its entire life, from delivery to Qantas in 1968 as a Boeing 707-338C named City of Hobart. It was then renamed Alice Springs in 1974. From there, it was sold to the Royal Australian Air Force and converted into a mid-air refueler, in this case usually designated as a KC-707. In 2006, the aircraft was paid off and broken up for scrap in 2009. The cockpit section was saved in Royal Australian Air Force colors and is now on display at the Shell Harbour Airport near Wollongong in New South Wales, Australia. Our last stop on this tour is across the Pacific Ocean in the South American nation of Colombia. This last confirmed Boeing 707 is also the only one in this video that is substantially complete. This aircraft's life is one of the more unusual ones as it did not start with Pan Am, TWA, or British Airways. In 1967, this aircraft was delivered to World Airways operating in and out of North America until 1970. At this point, the aircraft was wet leased to Pakistan Airlines for a year, and then in 1972, the aircraft made its way over to Korean Air on another lease. By 1976, Korean Air had purchased it outright for operations 
with that company until 1983, wherein the Colombian Air Force appears to have used this aircraft as both a VIP transport and a mid-air refueler. At some time before 2019, the aircraft was placed at the Colombian Air Force Museum on permanent outside display. We have three unconfirmed listings of preserved sections of 707s. This basically means that there are records online that a show a particular aircraft has been put on display, but I have not found any pictures to confirm that location. In the United Kingdom, there is supposed to be a new section of a Boeing 707 in one of the RAF museums. This aircraft started life with Northwest Airlines in 1965, but by 1973, technology already started making the 707 obsolete. It thus went to work out of Hong Kong with Cathay Pacific. It stayed there for nine years. By 1982, the aircraft turned up in Iceland, flying for a company called Eagle Air, just long enough to be leased by the Libyan airline known as Jamahiriya Air Transport, which became Libyan Arab Airlines in 1986. Later in 1986, the aircraft crossed the border into Egypt and flew for SAS Airline in Egypt. Our last records show that this aircraft had its nose section transferred to one of the RAF museums in the United Kingdom, but we cannot confirm if either the London or Midlands location has it currently or has ever had it. We travel across the English Channel to the Paris Orly Airport, south of Paris, France. The unconfirmed report is that a Boeing 707 has its nose section sitting somewhere either in the airport itself or on display somewhere nearby. This aircraft began its life after the Boeing factory with Air France in 1962. A couple of years in its time with Air France, this aircraft would go into Air Afrique on lease starting and ending in 1964. The aircraft would make its way back to Air France by the middle of 1964 and continue flying with them until early 1976, where this aircraft was retired. By 1977, this aircraft was on display somewhere in or near the Paris Orly Airport. Another mystery status of Boeing 707 lies south of Mexico. This, like other aircraft on our list, started its career with TWA. Its years of service with TWA were from 1967 to 1982. At this airport, the aircraft was broken up, with the exception of the nose section, which was eventually transported to a museum in Mexico. The problem is, we cannot confirm where in Mexico, and if it is, is it still on display today in early 2024? I mentioned the following aircraft only because it was mentioned several times to me in the comments of the previous 707 Museums video. At the Pima Air and Space Museum in Arizona, they have an EC-135 and a KC-135. During the 1980s, they had a former TWA 707 on the grounds as a parts hull for the other two aircraft. However, per my conversation with museum personnel, this aircraft has been completely gone since the early 2000s. And the latest news I've been able to learn is that the Boeing 707, previously owned by celebrity John Travolta, is all but complete, except for recertification of the engines. I do hope they can find someone who can recertify 60 plus year old engines for them to work long enough to get this aircraft back to New South Wales, Australia. Before we start a trip around the world to find the extant Boeing 720s, what do we really know about them? We can see the obvious resemblance to the precursor Boeing 707, which, while not starting the commercial jet age, made it successful. The Boeing 720 differed from the Boeing 707 in that it had a shorter fuselage and modified wings, which allowed it to excel at short-range trips using airfields and runways that were shorter than used by the Boeing 707s and its international contemporaries. Production started in 1959, with the last Boeing 720 finishing its career around 2010, an aircraft we will cover later. Let's start with the good news. There are several Boeing 720s that have been lovingly and not so lovingly preserved in museums around the world. These aircraft offer a unique opportunity to step back in time and experience the glamour of air travel in the 1960s. We begin our journey like the past few museum videos in North America where we find two examples of Boeing 720s in museums. First, we travel to Trenton, Ontario, Canada. Specifically, we start at the National Air Force Museum of Canada, where we find a strange-looking Boeing 720 displayed outside. The beginning of this aircraft story starts in early 1961 with American Airlines wearing the Astrojet livery and named Flagship Idaho. 
After a decade of service, this aircraft went to Middle East Airlines out of Beirut, Lebanon, and served the Middle Eastern market for 14 years before going into storage in Stansted Airport, England from 1985 to 1986. In early 1986, the aircraft was picked up not to fly passengers, to become an engine test bed for Pratt & Whitney Canada. An outsized nose was placed on these unique aircraft to test propeller and turboprop engines. Large turbofans could be tested by replacing the inner engine on the right wing with the engine to be tested. Also, small turbofans could be tested by being applied directly to the fuselage on the right-hand side. This aircraft was finally retired in the middle of 2010, and by 2012, was placed on outdoor display at the aforementioned National Air Force Museum of Canada, where it sits to this day in 2024. Our next stop is to the American Desert Southwest. Here at the Pima Air and Space Museum, we find the cockpit session of a Boeing 720 inside the main hall of the museum. This aircraft started its paying career with Western Airlines in the middle of 1961, where it would serve with the same airline until 1977. Air Malta picked up this aircraft to serve the Mediterranean market in 1978, where it would serve with them for just one month short of a decade. After this, the aircraft was initially stored at the Penal Air Park until it eventually made its way to the Tucson Boneyard, where it was picked apart for KC-135 parts, and the cockpit section was salvaged for display inside the Pima Air and Space Museum, where it still allows visitors to sit in the pilot seats today. We now travel to Europe find the remnant of only one Boeing 720 in existence on that continent. This lone surviving aircraft in Europe, and I put that word surviving in quotation marks, stands at the entrance of the Shannon Ireland International Airport. This aircraft, like the first aircraft we reviewed for North America, had very similar careers. Starting with American Airlines in early 1961 with the Astrojet livery, this airplane would transition to Middle East Airlines out of Lebanon in 1970 for a career that spanned just over two decades with this airline. This airliner was eventually stored at the Shannon International Airport and purchased by a company called Omega Air, which ended up stripping the aircraft for parts. The vertical stabilizer section was saved and given a sporty paint job and put on display in a decorative water display area at the entrance to the Shannon International Airport. We have three Boeing 720s on the ground and on display in Asia, with two of them on display in Pakistan alone. The first aircraft we will visit in Asia is currently on display indoors at the Gangshan Aviation Education Exhibition Hall next to the Republic of China Air Force Academy grounds. This aircraft spent the preponderance of its civilian career with Northwest Airlines starting in the middle of 1961. A British company called Tempair International Airlines would lease the aircraft in 1971 to operate this aircraft on charter journeys in and around Europe. However, this would only last a few months, as in December of that same year, the aircraft would be purchased by the Republic of China Air Force. This aircraft would fly as a VIP transport for the Taiwan Air Force until 1984, when it was withdrawn from service. Initially, this aircraft was placed on outdoor display at the Republic of China Air Force Museum, before being transferred at a later date to be displayed indoors at the Gangshan Aviation Education Exhibition Hall that was mentioned earlier. The next two aircraft can be talked about together since their individual careers very closely mirrored one another. They both started with Western Airlines in 1964, where they served the North American market for a decade. Both aircraft were acquired by Pakistan Airlines within a month of each other in 1974. The first aircraft was retired from service in late 1985 and placed on outdoor display at the Pakistan Airlines Planetarium in Karachi, Pakistan. The second aircraft left paying passenger service in September of 1986 and was placed on display at the Pakistan Airlines Planetarium in Lahore, Pakistan. Both aircraft show signs of wear and tear from being displayed outdoors, but we have found no information that either will be retired anytime soon. Before I leave this section of the video, some of you may be wondering why I did not include the Avieca 720 at the Museo de los Niños in Bogota, Colombia. Even if you look at Google Street View, you can see it's still there. However, the above view on Google Maps and my current information state and show that this aircraft was broken up in place in 2018. These are the few museums that have Boeing 720s on display. If you're ever in the vicinity of one of these museums, I highly recommend checking it out. You won't be disappointed.
While not on museum display, the following aircraft should be mentioned as they can be seen by the general public. Our first derelict aircraft can be found, if you know where to look, at the Israeli Air Force Museum at the Hatsrum Air Base. Of all our derelict aircraft presented here, it had the most diverse career. Starting in 1960, this aircraft, like others on our list, started with American Airlines wearing the Astrojet livery and named Flagship Mississippi. After 14 years with American Airlines, this aircraft spent most of the 1970s hopping from one airline to another. First it was with Somali Airlines for a year, then it flew for Dida Linhas Eras Mozambique, which unfortunately we can't find any photos for for just the few months of service. Then on to Cyprus Airways for one year's service. After that it bounced to and from Monarch Airlines while also serving with Air Ceylon and a quick return to Cyprus Airways. By the early 1980s, the airliner had finally landed, if you'll excuse the pun, with the Israeli airline known as MAOF, which was a long-distance, low-cost airline that existed briefly in the 1980s. It was purchased by the Israeli Aircraft Industries Company, where it received external modifications of an extended nose, but what was done for it on the inside is unknown at this time. By 1999, the aircraft was sitting abandoned at the Israeli Air Force Museum at the Hatsrum Air Base. Our next visit is to an aircraft with a very different career than most of the previous aircraft we've discussed. This airliner started its career with Eastern Airlines in 1961. After nearly a decade of flying Eastern U.S. and Caribbean routes, the aircraft winged its way to Scandinavia and flew for a company called Conair of Scandinavia for 11 years. After this, changes in ownership get a bit quicker. From 1981, Independent Air, which soon became Atlanta Skylux, operated the aircraft as a charter aircraft for vacationers to resort destinations. By 1986, the aircraft was owned by a single group called Eagle International Ministries. I imagine that's a church group that used the aircraft for far-flung travels for its purposes of its chosen ministry. Come 1991, and a company called Continental Aviation had purchased the aircraft. This company has no known connection to the old Continental Airlines that existed at the time. This aircraft sits retired at the International Airport near Nagpur, India. The final aircraft on a tour sits abandoned near the Quetzalcoatl International Airport in Nuevo Laredo in Tamaulipas, Mexico. United Airlines took initial delivery of this airliner in 1961. This aircraft's career with United would last about as long as it did with most companies that took delivery of brand new Boeing 720s. A company called Teal Industries would purchase the aircraft in 1973 and lease it to Aero America, a charter airline in 1975. From there, it would be leased to McCullough International Airlines, which used the aircraft to fly potential land purchasers to airports near sites that were up for sale. The aircraft was returned to Teal Industries from its lease in 1976, where it would then be purchased by a company called Argo Air International, which was just another aircraft leasing company. The aircraft was leased and then purchased by the Dominican-based Aramar Lineas Eras Dominicanas, starting with the lease in 1979 and then an outright purchase in 1983. It was then returned to Argo Air International for future operations in 1984, but it wasn't until 1992 that the aircraft was purchased by a company called Lambda Air. Rumors state that this aircraft was involved in a drug trafficking deal that went wrong, as the event was interrupted by the Mexican Federal Police. Since then, it's been derelict at the Quetzalcoatl International Airport. Exploring these derelict Boeing 720s is a great way to get off the beaten path and see a bit of aviation history up close. However, it's important to be aware that these aircraft are often located on private property and may be dangerous to approach. Always use caution and common sense if you're thinking about checking out one of these abandoned 720s. The Boeing 720 may be retired from commercial service, but it's still a fascinating aircraft with a rich history. Whether you're admiring it in a museum or spotting it in the middle of nowhere, there's no denying that the 720 is a true aviation icon. I hope you enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more aviation content. Thanks for watching. The KC-135 was developed when the need for a jet-powered mid-air refueler became apparent in the 1950s. Jet-powered bombers like the Boeing B-47 and the Boeing B-52 were flying at near-stall speeds flying behind aging KC-97 stratofreighters 
that were flying with their engines to the stops. Initially, Lockheed won the contract to build this new jet-powered mid-air refueler with its L-193 Constellation II design. However, to bridge the gap, Boeing showed that it could build the KC-135s in two years less time, and so 200 KC-135s were ordered, and eventually the Lockheed design was never built, and around 600 more KC-135s were built, which in turn led to the development of the rest of the KC-135 family. Museum displayed KC-135s and variants are mostly displayed outdoors with one exception, due to their size. As far as I've been able to tell, every KC-135 and or variant are displayed only in the United States. If I am incorrect in this, please let me know in the comments. Starting at the National Museum of the United States Air Force, this iconic museum in Dayton, Ohio, is home to the following KC-135 family members. Airframe 60-0329er is on display outdoors at the Air Force Museum, sitting across Spat Street from the main parking lot. It was a KC-135 station during the 1990s at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam with the 203rd Air Refueling Squadron of the Hawaii Air National Guard. This aircraft has had F-108 high-bypass engines since 1986. These engines are the military designation for the civilian CF-56 engines found in many airliners today. Sitting right next to this aircraft is a retired EC-135 airframe 60-0374. Delivered in 1961, the aircraft was used for a time as a program Apollo rain instrumentation aircraft. This aircraft was re-engined in 1982 with the low bypass turbofans taken from retired 707 aircraft. This aircraft flew for a time with the 452nd Flight Test Squadron, a member of the 412th Operations Group, and was the last EC-135 built for the United States Air Force. Also at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but no longer on display at the museum as they made room for a future C-5M Galaxy aircraft, is Airframe 55-3123. Initially, this aircraft started as a standard KC-135, but became a unique aircraft as for a time it carried the NKC-135 designation. This aircraft and two other KC-135s were heavily modified for electronics warfare testing and as a target aircraft the YAL-1 Laser Defense Program. This aircraft is currently on the tarmac at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base within view of the museum, but is no longer accessible to the general public. Our next stop on this trip to find all the displayed KC-135s takes us to the outdoor displayed aircraft at the Pima Air and Space Museum near Tucson, Arizona. The first aircraft you might come upon is Airframe 63 8 this aircraft started life out as a USAF KC-135. Our records show that for a time, this aircraft flew for the 917th Air Refueling Squadron out of Diaz Air Force Base in Texas. 2004, this aircraft was transferred to NASA control and became one of three NASA C-135 aircraft that tested zero-G conditions on people and equipment. These aircraft were humorously known as Vomit Comets. On display at Pima, this aircraft still sports its NASA livery. Sitting not far from that aircraft is Airframe 63-8057. Built from delivery as an EC-135, this aircraft served for a time as an emergency night watch aircraft in case of nuclear war and as a member aircraft of Operation Blue Watch in 1974. The aircraft was retired to Pima in 1993. Our journey now takes us over to the Strategic Air Command and Aerospace Museum located near Ashland, Nebraska. Airframe 63-8049er was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1964 and initially was a standard KC-135 refueling aircraft. By 1966, the aircraft had been converted into an EC-135 and from 1992 to 2023, the aircraft was displayed outdoors at the SAC Museum but recently was moved indoors and is currently on display there without its wings. During its service time, this aircraft mostly served squadrons out of Offutt Air Force Base but served in its capacity as an EC-135 in several other states as well, ending its career with the local Alpha Air Force Base 55th Strategic Reconnaissance Wing. Now we go see what lays on display in the state of California. At the March Airfield Air Museum, along with many other large aircraft such as bombers and others, we find that the KC-135, known as Airframe 55-3130. This was the 13th KC-135 delivered to the United States Air Force from Boeing, doing so in 1957. When this aircraft was retired to become part of this collection, it was known as Old Grandad. 
A few counties to the north, we find the former Castle Air Force Base and the Castle Air Force Museum. Outside of that museum sits airframe 55-313er, currently sandwiched in between a B-36 Peacemaker and an XP-47 Stratojet. This aircraft was delivered to the USAF in 1957 and still carries the original turbojets from when it was first produced. Outside of Edwards Air Force Base is the Air Force Flight Test Museum. Here we actually find two members of the KC-135 family on display. Airframe 60-0377 is the second of the two NC-NKC-135s in this video. This aircraft was delivered to the Air Force in 1961, where for most of its service life it was a standard C-135. However, during the development of the B-2 Spirit Bomber, this aircraft was chosen to be equipped with the avionics, radar, and navigation systems of the upcoming bomber prior to being built. This aircraft flew over 300 sorties for that program before being retired. The other aircraft at this museum is Airframe 61-2669, delivered in 1962 to the United States Air Force. Built as a standard C-135, the aircraft spent some time as a WC-135 Constant Phoenix, which was used as a particulate sample aircraft, which basically means it was used to detect airborne radioactive contamination from nuclear weapons tests that were conducted in the atmosphere in violation of the 1963 Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. We travel next to the state of Kansas to find a pair of KC-135 family members in two different museums. Outside of the Kansas Aviation Museum sits Airframe 56-3658 which was delivered in 1958 to the United States Air Force as its standard KC-135 Alpha. In 1984, it received four low-bypass engines taken from retired Boeing 707s. This aircraft served a majority of its service life with the 190th Air Refueling Wing as a member of the Kansas Air National Guard until it was retired to the museum. Our second airframe in Kansas is Airframe 57 1429 which can be found at the Museum of the Kansas National Guard, which is just off the grounds of the Topeka Regional Airport. Although technically a museum piece, it also stands outside next to the access road to the airport, so it also could be considered a gate guard aircraft. The rest of our museum aircraft are the only KC-135 family aircraft on display in their state. Next, we travel to Barksdale Air Force Base outside of Shreveport, Louisiana, to find our next displayed KC-135 family member. This is Airframe 56-3595 and it was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1957 and still to this day is engine with its original four turbojets. After it was withdrawn from service in 1994, it was put on permanent display at the Barksdale Global Power Museum. Unlike other museums on our list, this museum is on Air Force grounds, so you will need to complete a visitor pass before visiting. These can be downloaded before your visit from their website. Back to the west we go to visit the Hill Aerospace Museum outside of Salt Lake City, Utah, on the northernmost end of the Hill Air Force Base. Airframe 57-1510 was delivered to the active duty component of the United States Air Force in 1958. Over the years, it was upgraded to the low bypass turbofans from 707s and eventually would end its days with the Utah Air National Guard as a member of the 151st Air Refueling Wing. Up in South Dakota, specifically, we find the EC-135 Airframe 61-0262. This aircraft is located outside the South Dakota Air and Space Museum, located southeast of Ellsworth Air Force Base. This aircraft was retired in 1992, still supporting its original turbojets on its wings. In the Hoosier State, outside and northeast of the Grissom Joint Air Reserve Base, is another member of the EC-135 group. Airframe 61-0269er is a bit of an oddball as it was designated as an EC-135L since it was converted into an airborne command post in 1967. The aircraft was retired to the Grissom Air Museum in 1992 with the paint scheme at war during Operation Desert Storm. Airframe 61-0327 was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1961 originally as a C-135. It was soon converted into an EC-135 for use in the Apollo program as a ranged instrumentation aircraft. The aircraft went to work for Central Command, otherwise known as CENTCOM, which provides command and control of U.S. forces in the Middle East. There it would stay until retired in 2003, 
and then sent to the Museum of Aviation outside of Warner Robins Air Force Base in central Georgia for outdoor display. The last museum piece on this video today is at the Air Mobility Command Museum just off the Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. Airframe 57-1507 is a KC-135 Alpha delivered to the U.S. Air Force in 1958. This aircraft flew for parts of its service life with the New Jersey Air National Guard before being retired to the Air Mobility Command Museum in 2009. Gate guards are aircraft that either by themselves or with other related aircraft are posted outside a facility to show the public what kind of work goes on in that base. Some of these can be visited by the general public, others have their access controlled by military security forces. So please, before going to see one of these gate guard aircraft, make sure not to violate any base access rules. Scott Air Force Base is a rare case for a gate guard aircraft, as there are three aircraft that can be seen but all under different circumstances. Airframe 56 Tax 3611 is the one true gate guard aircraft on the Scott Air Force Base list. It is located near the main gate of the Air Force Base and is accessible by the general public by a parking lot that is outside the fence line of the Air Force Base. This aircraft was delivered in 1957 and it got a low bypass engine upgrade in 1984. Its date of retirement is not known but it was put on display at the Scott Field Heritage Air Park in 2009, where it stands today with several other aircraft. The second aircraft on the list is found well inside Scott Air Force Base and only qualifies as a gate guard since it's not a museum piece either. Airframe 59-1487 was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1960 and while in service flew for the 126 Air Refueling Wing of the Illinois National Air Guard until 2011 when it was retired. Instead of being installed as a gate guard, it stands near the middle of the main part of the base, just off the flight line of the 126 air refueling wing. Aircraft number three at Scott Air Force Base is not a gate guard, nor does it seem to be a museum piece. Airframe 63-8010, delivered in 1963, is currently on the far northern flight line of the base, otherwise known as Mid-America St. Louis Airport near Boeing's offices and can be seen from Interstate 64 as you pass by. We have no knowledge of what is to become of this aircraft in the near future. We find ourselves back at McConnell Air Force Base, where earlier in the video we reviewed the history of a KC-135 that sits as a museum piece at the Kansas Aviation Museum. We now find Airframe 553118 that is the oldest preserved member of the C-135 family. It, along with the B-47 Stratajet, and an F-105 Thunder Chief are all gate guards at the main gate of McConnell Air Force Base. This aircraft was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1956 and is named the City of Britain, where this aircraft was manufactured. Now we travel to Abilene, Texas and the Dias Air Force Base to find our next gate guard aircraft. Airframe 56-3639er was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1958 and served three and a half decades before being retired to Dias Air Force Base. It should be noticed that this gate guard and its companion aircraft are located inside the Dias Air Force Base, and you will need to gain access via the co-located visitor control center to see this and the other aircraft. Airframe 57-1458 is the furthest north displayed aircraft, gate guard, or museum piece, as it is located within the grounds of Isleson Air Force Base near Fairbanks, Alaska. Delivered in 1958, this aircraft has been converted into a KC-135E, which means it was switched from turbojets to the low-bypass turbofans from the 1980s. This aircraft went on display in 1997. Outside Portsmouth, New Hampshire, you will find what used to be Peace Air Force Base, but which is now known as Peace International Airport. Airframe 57-1455 is located across the street from the New Hampshire National Air Guard Recruiting Office just off airport grounds. This aircraft was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1958 and was converted to the turbofan-powered KC-135E model in 1982. Whether this one is standing gate guard or not is debatable, since it is, one, not located with the other gate guard aircraft that are outside the flight line, and two, on a patch of tarmac inside the flight line. However, Airframe 57-1495, located on the Nebraska Air National Guard Base outside of Lincoln, Nebraska, is listed as a preserved aircraft. This aircraft retired in 2009, 
since being delivered to the United States Air Force in 1958. Southern Oklahoma is the site of our next gate guard aircraft. Airframe 580070 is co-located with the Lockheed C-141 Bravo Starlifter. These two aircraft are located outside of Altus Air Force Base. This aircraft is in its KC-135 Alpha configuration, even though it was re-engined with low-bypass turbofans during its service period. The aircraft served in the United States Air Force from 1958 to 2009. The second vomit comment on our overall list for this video is currently standing gate guard outside the Lone Star Flight Museum, but it's not part of its collection. Airframe 59-1481 was delivered as a KC-135 Alpha to the United States Air Force in 1960. The aircraft was provided to the Federal Aviation Administration for route proving for other aircraft, then it went on to NASA to become one of their three zero-G experience aircraft. As a note, most of the weightless scenes inside Apollo 13 were filmed inside this aircraft. NASA retired this aircraft sometime after 1995. Airframe 591497 is located next to a traffic circle on the grounds of McGuire Air Force Base. Other aircraft at this traffic circle are a Lockheed C-141 Bravo Starlifter and a McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II. There is no info on when this KC-135 was acquired by the United States Air Force, nor when it was retired. At the Zorinsky Memorial Airport, just inside the fence line of Offutt Air Force Base in eastern Nebraska, you can find a Boeing B-52 Stratofortress and an EC-135 Alpha with the airframe number of 61-0287. While looking like they may be publicly accessible, these two planes are in fact behind a security fence near the Kinney Gate of the base. This EC-135 was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1962 and flew as an airborne command post for most of its career until retired in 1992. Along with several other aircraft located with it, a C-135 family member with the airframe number of 61-2671 are all gate guards just inside the fence line of Tinker Air Force Base. It is located between the base commissary, aka the base grocery store, and Interstate 40 going through Oklahoma City. Delivered in 1961, this aircraft was then retired in 1991 to its present location. Last but not least is the KC-135 with the airframe number 63-8005. This aircraft is posted as a gate guard aircraft at Grand Forks Air Force Base in North Dakota. This aircraft and the other aircraft and relative equipment are located outside the fence line next to the visitor control center at the base's main entrance. This aircraft was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1963 and was retired to its current location in 1994. Perhaps the most famous C-137 are those that are referred to as Air Force One, the call sign of the aircraft carrying the President of the United States. These aircraft were procured by the United States Air Force to bring the transportation services of the United States President up to the standards other world leaders were beginning to enjoy with the advent of the jet-powered airliner age. Five C-137s, each designated as a Special Air Mission Aircraft, or otherwise known as SAM, were known as SAM-970, SAM-971, SAM-972, SAM-2600, and SAM-1000. In 1959, these aircraft served in the prestigious role from 1959 to 2001. Four of these five aircraft are preserved today. Let's visit their final resting places. The Museum of Flight is located in the southern half of the King County Airport, also known as Boeing Field. The SAM 970 aircraft was delivered to the United States Air Force in 1959 as a replacement for President Eisenhower's Lockheed Constellation. This was the first of six aircraft that were ordered for this role, however only three were completed. President Eisenhower was the first to take a trip on this aircraft, which he did on August 26, 1959. SAM 970 was also known to carry Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. Later on, it would be used by Secretary of State Henry Kissinger for his peace talks with North Vietnam, diplomacy with mainland China, and his shuttle diplomacy efforts in the Middle East in 1974. This aircraft remained in federal service until 1996. It is on loan to the Museum of Flight from the United States Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio.
This next aircraft was designated SAM-27000 and was the second purpose-built Air Force One from Boeing, based on the Boeing 707-353B model. This aircraft served seven presidents, starting with President Nixon and ending with the second President Bush. This aircraft is displayed above the floor in the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library Museum, along with several other artifacts from his presidency. After President Carter's presidency, he was sent on this aircraft to Germany to greet the returning former hostages held by Iran in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. This aircraft is on loan from the United States Air Force. At the National Museum of the United States Air Force, we will find the aircraft that was designated as SAM-26000, which was the first of the purpose-built Air Force One aircraft, like SAM-27000. This was the primary aircraft for Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, before being relegated to being a secondary aircraft on the arrival of SAM-27000. It was this aircraft that first received the now familiar livery that all Air Force One aircraft are now painted in. This was also the aircraft that, sadly, President Kennedy flew to his fateful trip to Dallas, Texas in 1963 and returned his body to Washington, D.C. to be laid at rest in Arlington National Cemetery. Sam 26000's last presidential mission was to fly President Clinton from an event in Illinois when Sam 27000 was grounded. This aircraft now resides inside the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio, since its last flight in 1998. As you may have seen from my previous videos, covering the locations of now-preserved Boeing 707-derived aircraft, the Pima Air and Space Museum has two members of the C-135 family of aircraft, along with the VC-137 SAM 971. This aircraft was delivered to the United States Air Force as a modified Boeing 707-120. This aircraft, like SAM 970, was initially painted with orange markings before receiving the now-current Air Force One livery. This aircraft was retired from Air Force One service when SAM 26000 was delivered in 1962, and its new livery reflected this change in status. This was also the aircraft that flew the freed Iran hostages to the United States after they were treated for any injuries in Germany. This aircraft was retired from Air Force service in 1999 and put on display at the Pima Museum shortly thereafter in its Air Force Two livery. Sadly, SAM 972 is not on this list as this aircraft was scrapped for recycling in 1996 as this aircraft was found with severe corrosion issues. While the VC-137s captured the public eye, several other C-137 variants served diverse roles. Across the desert home of Davis Monthan Air Force Base from the Pima Air and Space Museum, it's the 309th Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group, or AMARG for short. This is home to an EC-137D or E, depending on the source material. This aircraft started out life as a normal commercial Boeing 707-355C. The aircraft would see many owners in many nations between 1967 and 1992 when it began its U.S. Air Force career. It flew with such airlines as Airlift International, Air Bahama, Caledonian Airways, which became British Caledonian, then on to Britannia Airways, finally flying with St. Lucia Air. After all this, it returned to the United States to fly government contracted flights, much in the same way as EG&G aircraft flying in and out of Las Vegas to surrounding Air Force bases today. In 1992, this aircraft was purchased by the United States Air Force and converted into an EC-137. What and where this aircraft was used is unknown at this time. The aircraft was retired to the Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona to be preserved and cared for by the 309th AMARG. What is being preserved for is unknown and the aircraft cannot be visited by the general public. The C-137's reach extends beyond U.S. borders. The nation of Spain is listed as having preserved two of this aircraft type. One of these aircraft is eventually slated to be put on display at the Museo de Aeronautica y Astronautica, southwest of downtown Madrid. This aircraft started its flying career as a normal airliner, 
for Northwest Airlines in 1966 as a Boeing 707-351C. By 1973, the aircraft had received a cargo freighter conversion and served with the Greek airliner Olympic as a cargo freighter. Then, in 1989, the aircraft began serving the cargo market in Africa with EAS Airlines. Sometime after that, the aircraft received another conversion, this time to being a KC-137 with drogue refueler assemblies on both wings. This aircraft served for this purpose until 1996 when it was withdrawn from service. The aircraft was then donated to the Museo de Aeronautica y Astronautica, sitting outside of the Cuatro Vientos Air Base in southwestern Madrid. The latest pictures we have of this aircraft show it off the museum grounds and without its rudder assembly. Current pictures show that this aircraft is sitting at the Spanish Air Force Base Getafe, along with the next aircraft on our list. As mentioned before, this next Spanish Air Force VC-137E started out life as a normal commercial Boeing 707-368C. The aircraft was initially purchased by Saudi Airlines for service in and around the Middle Eastern nation of Saudi Arabia. After a decade of service in the Middle East, the aircraft wound up being converted into a VC-137 for the Spanish Air Force. This aircraft would serve in that role until 2016 when it became the last Boeing 707 in Spanish Air Force service. Like the aircraft we mentioned before, this aircraft is currently sitting at the Spanish Air Force Base Getafe in southern Madrid, awaiting full preservation and display. Some sources say that this aircraft has been donated to the King Juan Carlos University of Madrid, but this is yet unconfirmed. For those of you who are wondering, there is one more C-137 out there. However, its status is unknown at this time, as my usual sources say it's active, but I cannot find anything to really prove that. This aircraft started life with Olympic Airways as a 707-384C in 1968. It was converted into a KC-137 for the Venezuelan Air Force by the Israeli Aerospace Industries Company around 1990. It has served that nation since then, but as stated earlier, whether or not it's truly active is unknown. From presidential missions to the daily grind of passenger flight, the Boeing 707 family holds a unique place in aviation history. Each preserved aircraft tells the story of innovation, service, and human ambition. As we continue to learn from these remarkable machines, they inspire us to soar even higher towards the future. Thank you for joining us on this journey through time. Our next preserved aircraft video will be coming out in about a week. Thank you for everyone who watched all these videos when they came out separately and to those watching this final product, you're the reasons I keep this channel going. On screen now are those who have joined my Patreon page with their considerate donations. Please consider making your own donations. Thank you so very much for watching our channel, and we hope to see you all again soon.